Welcome to PM Express Business Edition. In just a few days from now, Ghanaians will go to the polls to actually elect that political party or presidential candidate to run or manage the economy for the next four years. But going into these elections, we've heard a lot of these political parties and presidential candidates are actually given lots of promises. But the critical question that we're asking ourselves is how are they going to finance all these promises that they've outlined in their manifesto. And what about the business community? What are their expectations going into these elections and even next year? What are the real challenges out there? Well, here on PM Express Business Edition, I'll be doing this program with no other person than Senior Finance Lecturer, Dr. Lord Mensa, joining me in studio here. And he's also a finance economist as well. We're doing justice to it in terms of looking at all the perspective and also via zoom we're joined by business strategist uh, lawyer for Sudote with ab ap david and law and also the president of the private enterprise federation now say bonsu and chief executive of the association of ghana industries said chumakabwa all these things wrapped up right here on pm express right back after this break Welcome back to PM Express Business Edition as you look at uh, financing those uh, political promises in the manifestos. And what are the business community, what are the expectations going into these elections and even going into 2021? Dr. Lord Mensah is a senior finance lecturer and a finance economist at the University of Ghana Business School. Doc, thank you so much uh, for joining us yeah, today. You're Forgive me. You're welcome, George. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm very, very, very. I mean, going into these elections again, are you surprised by the promises that these uh, presidential candidates are outlining, focusing on those two major political parties? Yeah, really, if you ask me whether I'm surprised or not, I will tell you, yes, I was surprised. Mm. Um, clearly, you could see two hands mm. of uh, manifestos that have been, you know, promised. One more or less um, coming afresh. Mm. The other more or less consolidating the gains that they've made in the past. And clearly, I mean, you could see that they all involve financing. Mm. And looking at the situation now, I mean, you cannot take, you know, financing out of hand and say, hey, this is an isolated year. Mm. So. Investors are going to put their money. Pensioners are going to put their money in your environment as and where they want it. We had COVID, for which you know has dried up you know global financial yeah, yeah, you know structure, yeah. and everybody is aware of that. And as a result of that, we're looking at going forward what 2021 will be. Mm. And so, if you look at the structure of the promises that were given, it gives you the signal that we still live in that optimistic you know kind of um, situation before mm. COVID. And so the question will be, where would the money be coming from? from yeah. Are you looking at external financing? Are you looking at internal financing? At the heels of you know, your debt level, you know, whether the current administration continues or the previous administration turns up to you know, take over. So effectively, there are so many you know, questions that are running through the mind um, of people like me as mm. I sit down you know, and analyze situations. You know, Africa has been dubbed as a country where, sorry, as a continent where if a, if a country exceeds more than 50% of its revenue generation paying for debt, you know, then it becomes uh, more or less a problem, you know, which again, if you relate it to our GDP, you're talking about 70% of, of, of our GDP, you know, as um, debt payment, mm. then you've got into a threshold where it becomes more or less dangerous you know, for, for, the, for that country. And so um, looking at the promises and the space that we have, I ask myself, OK, fine, <laughs> where would the money be coming from? Do, do you think that the, these presidential candidates, and as, we, as you zoom in on, because the race is just between the MPP and the NDC as well, do you think that they have this at the back of their mind about how to finance some of these things, the reality out there? I think they do. I mean, because um, if you look at our environment, the investor appetite is not that kind of a long term. 
if you look at um, the, 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 the investment space, mm. you realize that if you pick a typical investment fund in this country, mm. a chunk of the money is in money market instrument. Yeah. Now, money market instrument, uh, largely you're going about one year, you know, for which if you want to use that to finance, you know, infrastructure, will be a problem because the cash flows that comes from structure that we target in roads and all those are mainly, you know, long term. So if you have an environment where the investor appetite is mainly long term, if you look at our MPRO, you know, National Pensions Regulations, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, portfolio structure that we're supposed to invest pensioners' money in, chunk of them are in money market instrument, mm. you know. So effectively, it tells you that anytime you want to go into, you know, infrastructure development, that the, ta the cash flows are more or less long term, you have to look outside. Mm. And I'm not surprised that is what is building up into our debt gradually because the investor appetite or the investor horizon in this country is mainly short term. And so uh, with the infrastructure, you know, development that has been promised by the various, you know, political parties, uh, I would say, okay, fine. The financing is, will mainly come from outside. Mm. And uh, if it is coming from outside, Fine. At what interest rate? I so, I mean, you, you see more going into next year, whichever party that wins, NDC, MPP, there, there's going to be more borrowing. Some are also talking about increasing tax rate to deal with that challenge. Well, if we want to increase tax rate, we need to do some investment. Mm. You know, we always talk about increasing revenue, increasing revenue. It looks like but that's then, the cheaper way. Yeah, but you, you have to understand that your expenditure needs to reflect your, you know, um, increase in revenue that you're thinking about in the future. Mm. If you are spending now, and chunk of the monies are going into areas that will not reflect in your revenue generation, then trust me, increasing revenue will not work. Mm. We're talking about a situation where we've invested in digital address system, for instance. Yeah. We've in invested in um, you know, identification of individuals. Mm. We've invested in paperless port. We've invested in things that, you know, should be able to identify one or two businesses at you know vantage places mm. to ensure that we bring them into the tax net. Mm. Now we are yet to see a reflection of that into you know our revenue collection. Mm. So effectively, what I would say is that if we are spending now, right, we should think about how that spending builds up into revenue, mm. especially when you are accruing debt. You go into road construction, mm. a typical road is supposed to finance itself. Mm. When you construct a road, for instance, from here to Siapa, right, you expect that in the next 13 years to 15 years, that road will pay for itself. Yeah. But then what do we see in this country? Can we quantify and say with the avalanche of portfolio of infrastructure that we have, pick out one or two and say, hey, these are paying for themselves. They are all categorized in the form of kind of a social investment, which we don't even think about the possible, you know, um, benefit or the possible returns that those investments are supposed to what, yield to pay for itself. Mm. So we look at it, okay, government has provided a road. After a while, at the end of the day, how the road is paying itself, we don't think about it. So mm. effectively, all these things are things that builds up and you ask yourself, okay, fine, we've promised all the, you know, uh, what do we call it, infrastructure development in education sector, real, in uh, what do we call it? health sector, in, uh, you can name them, I mean. But then, how are we going to find? You, you see a challenge there in financing all these projects? Being I climate. see a huge challenge, you know, going forward. Doc, let me bring in the business community as well. Lawyer for Sudote is a partner at AB and David. Danao Sebons, who is the president of the Private Enterprise Federation. And Sechuma Kabwa is the chief executive of Association of Ghana Industries. Let me first start with Lawyer Fosudote. I mean, you engage a lot of businesses out there. Testing the pulse of businesses beyond these elections again, what are their concerns? Well, the concerns of businesses are just in Ghana, it's just like the concerns of businesses uh, everywhere. They want to first and foremost uh, sustain their various enterprises and then uh, especially in the COVID era and to make sure it doesn't get worse than it was before the COVID and more importantly to recover and then ensure that they grow 
So that's that's a concern of businesses. So when businesses look at the promises of government, uh, both verbal and in the written manifesto, uh, as well as they look at the opposition, um, and again, without uh, meaning harm, I will echo what uh, 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 Doc said. Mm -hmm. uh, it's either going to be between uh, either going to be NDC or MPP. I, I, I do know a couple of parties want to cause electric shock, but I'm not so sure mm -hmm. uh, whether or not we can actually get the electric shock. So in a realistic situation, it's going to be one of them. So if we zero in on the promises of these two, then the businesses will be looking at whether or not the delivery of these promises impact on the sustainability and growth of their businesses. So that's exactly where the concerns of businesses, uh, are, as, as at least the businesses I do speak to. I mean, you, you also in one way or the other help businesses in raising funds as well. And are you surprised at the level of these promises that, listen, is more of a clear present danger? Or, or what, when you look into the crystal ball, and I know a program that you do as a crystal ball, looking into the crystal ball, and I'll be coming back to you. Uh, you, you do predictions at times as well, maybe to get your thoughts on that one. But looking into this crystal ball, in terms of real funding out there, do you think that, listen, let's be realistic here. Things are not going to be easy for us going to next year. I, I, I think... Uh, you look into the crystal ball based on facts. And, and let's, let's look at how government funds these projects. Uh, so, so that's the way to approach it. One is through taxes. Uh, the other one is through proceeds from sales. Uh, the, the other one is uh, through loans and another miscellaneous income. So if I took uh, all of them, uh, one, I mean, uh, intense uh, taxes, uh, yes, uh, we do collect uh, taxes and always promise to widen the tax net and collect more. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen to the extent that we expect, even though each, each government uh, appears to have done better in terms of widening it and increasing it. But of course, as as, as Doc said, it also appeared to be uh, matched by the expenditure. So the variance that you need in order to free the space to, to fund projects is tight. Now, so the question is, if I'm focusing on taxes, can we increase taxes or can we widen the, the tax net? Widen, yes, we can. And I've looked at a couple of the manifestos in terms of the promises of how to widen. And they look real. The ability to implement is another matter. But increasing taxes, I don't think uh, uh, it, it, it will happen. And, and why do I say that? We must look at things in terms of context. Currently, Ghana is about 25% of corporate tax, if we take corporate tax alone, and VAT. In, in a new era we are entering from January 1, where we are in the Africa free trade area, the competitor economies like Mauritius, for example, who are doing 15% corporate tax, whilst we are doing 25, or you take Botswana, which is doing 22.5. Uh, 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 and if you look at the fact that we, you can trade in goods across the continent, then it will not be a very smart decision to be increasing taxes. So I think in that area, we are a bit tight. And if you look at how the income we generate is used, uh, about 32% goes into compensating public sector workers about another 29% goes, and I'm using just the next quarter uh, projected uh, budgetary expenditure for the government. About 29% is going to pay interest rates and 12% to amortize what we have already borrowed. That's about 40%. If you add a 40% to the 32, the space with which to fund the promises is very narrow. Then I will take the next uh, uh, segment, which is sale of assets. Do we have any assets to sell? Privatization days are gone. So there is really little room there. And then you want to look at whether public-private partnerships will be the mechanisms for private sector to come in. Uh, yes, that's, that's a way. And I think there are some plans to pass laws in parliament. But we've not tested that uh, sector uh, very well in view of cancellation of previous mm -hmm. projects over the past uh, years. I mean, and I'm not talking about this recent years, over the decade. So that's a challenging terrain. And then lastly, in terms of other sources of income, like from state-owned enterprises, which could have given us a large chunk of receivables, but they have rather ended up becoming a burden. Uh, I'm aware SIGA is trying to change the story and make it better. But as of now, uh, most of the state-owned enterprises are rather a burden to government. So mm. I see very little space in terms of funding, except in borrowing, mm. which may then worsen the situation. So we need to be very creative to mm. fund these 
promises that we are making. I'll come back to you because I still want to look at into your crystal ball that you always look at in your okay. program that you do. But let me go to and also to so private enterprise federation. I mean, maybe my, if you had looked at these promises and these manifestos that have been put out, do you think that at the end of the day, private sector will be the winner? Or listen, George, there are still some serious challenges ahead for us with respect to whichever way we'll go going into these elections and now. Now, if you can unmute your um, button, I'll be so grateful, Nana. Can, can, can you hear me now? Yes, Nana, I can hear you loud and clear. If I can repeat Thank my you. question okay. that, or if you had it, Nana, please, that going into this election, Perf, looking at all the promises from these two political parties, you think the private sector will be the winner? There's talk about Ghana cares, there's talk about massive infrastructure, uh, private sector leading the growth and all the rest. Are you satisfied? Listen, George. Uh, we are really watching carefully. Well, government revenue sources are limited, taxes. And Ghana, the tax percentage to GDP is about 13.9, 40%. That's inadequate. Because we are not doing the tax administration correctly. We are taxing so much. The majority of the people or the businesses are falling through the cracks. We just recently published a tax review where we think that tax should not be one shoe fits all. If you're small potatoes, you pay 25. If you're a giant, you pay 25%. No, it got to be a staggered system where based upon your income levels, you pay a certain percentage. In other jurisdictions, if you are, it's based upon turnover. If your turnover is up to 100,000, you pay one fee, maybe 2,000 CDs a year. If it's more than that, between that and 3%, you pay about 3% a year, staggered all the way up to five, uh, six, seven percent. But we have 20 percent, 25 percent against all businesses. Now, people or investors don't set up businesses to pay taxes. They set up businesses to make money. Mm -hmm. And if by paying taxes, their, their business is going to collapse, they wouldn't pay. They say, cash me if you can. And they run. So what we had done for the past two years, review with GRA and all, the tax element in Ghana. How would that allow businesses to pay taxes and at the same time be able to maintain their business and grow to create jobs and opportunities? Mm -hmm. That is what government should be looking at. Secondly, tax administration is costly because you're not making it easy for people to pay taxes sitting at home and then writing the checks and then, you know, so the government can get the revenue. People are shifting from one location to the other and tax administrations are chasing them as a follow-up and they don't do well. So that is how we have a low percentile to GDP of our tax system compared to our neighbors. Nigeria has a staggered tax system. That's what we're looking at, a tier tax system from various African countries. So what we are advising government, instead of the manifesto, which is just a promissory note, do things. Where is your revenue base? Where are your taxes or your uh, liquidity coming from? Liquidity is not only from taxes. Government should create the, uh, in the avenue for businesses mm -hmm. to implement and do things. Uh, so now do, I, do I get from you that from these two political parties, listen, show us how you're going to fund these promises. It is not too late for this to December 7th. We had, a, we had engagement with NDC in August on their manifesto, and we gave them a litany of things that they can do to create revenue. We didn't meet with the t uh, manifesto writers of uh, NPP because they were tied up, but we submitted the same uh, paper to them because we don't see where they're coming from, what they're saying they're going to create A, B, C, D. If you look at the manifesto, they tax forgiveness for two years, for three years, and that is not going to cut it. It ain't going to help because government doesn't have the revenue. So what we look at in our system, pension schemes, that's what you use to accumulate capital. We don't have capital. Look at our stock exchange. There's no patronage. It hasn't moved an inch. So what you need is liquidity in the system with the support of Bank of Ghana buying bonds from different corporate institutions to float and release funding into the system mm. that will allow people to use to purchase things. In turn, that will yield tax revenues to government. Mm. But if you sit back and say, oh, I'm going to tax at 6%, and I heard some politicians talking about increasing taxes. If you add all the fees that businesses pay, 
plus the corporate taxes and all, they pay about 43 to 47 percent of their income into some sort of taxes. Nobody is going to do that. And so a majority of them don't pay the taxes. Mm. A majority mm. of them don't mm. pay. Mm. And they don't even know how to calculate the taxes anyway. If mm. you go to GRE, and now that GRE is coming up with what we call ITAPS, that will allow people to aggregate their uh, data and collect, you know, uh, uh, business records. Mm. Then at the end of the year, they can tap a button and calculate the tax liability. Some businesses even pay more than they do. Okay. Even okay. pay more than is required okay. of them. So okay. the manifesto is just a promissory uh, advice that, yes, we take kindly, but we know for sure that it's not going to happen. You're not even qualified as a promissory note, Nana. <laughs> Nana, I'll also come back to you. Let me go to Seth Jum Akwabwa, Chief Executive Association of Ghana Industries. If you look at these two manifestos, it's clear that there's a push towards an industrial era going into next year. Does it bring you some excitement at the Association of Ghana Industries? Well, thank you, George. Um, I think, in principle, uh, the manifestos appear beautiful. A lot of promises in there. Both parties, especially NDC and PP, they are all giving promises uh, in respect to industry. NPP is talking about strengthening the uh, one district, one factory, and all the industrial issues that are there. I think they're already making a lot of uh, inroads there. NDC is also coming up with its own industrial agenda. So I think in principle, there are promises and industries thrive on finance and both are also promising to make funds available. If you look at the N NDC, uh, MPP manifesto, they are talking of a hundred billion, mm. you know, facility program. under the CARES program. NDC is also setting up that 10 billion uh, dollar facility. So all these promises are there, they are good. The bigger question, is what has been uh, highlighted by the other speakers, that where are we going to generate the funds to support all this? That is the biggest challenge, because we are quite limited in a lot of the sources that we generate funds. Taxes, loans, uh, proceeds from sales, the enterprise, state enterprises, their contribution to GDP. We have challenges in all these areas. So the bigger question is, how are we going to generate the resources to do all this? Are we going to borrow more? And what is the implication of borrowing more? Yeah. Is it going to translate into a kind of taxes on, on, on already overburdened enterprises and businesses and industries? These are questions we need to ask. I think that what we are not seeing clearly in the manifestos is the a clear roadmap as to how these funds will be mobilized. <laughs> Figures have been mentioned. It should make us excited because if all these funds are going to be pumped into the system, then industries ordinarily should get access to good funds and do good ticket business. But the question is, where is the money coming from? And it's not clear in the manifesto how these funds are going to be generated. So much as we may be excited about the promises that has been made, we can't be too excited about how the funds are going to be generated and its implication on businesses. For all you know, the alternative will be to increase taxes. And that has its own implications. The very industries that we are trying to support, if they are going to be burdened with additional taxes, which is going to make them uncompetitive in the local environment. And with the CFTA coming on, on, on the scene, it means that we are not even going to be competitive in the whole of Africa. Mm. So all these are challenges and potential threats uh, for, for mm. businesses. So mm. one cannot be fully excited yet until we interrogate the figures, we interrogate the facts, and clearly see a, a roadmap in how all these funds will be generated. And, and work out its implication mm. on business mm. before mm. you can get excited. Mm. Mm. I'll come back to you for your last pick as you go into these elections and even going into next year. But let me get back to you, Doc. I mean, two things. And when we go to the polls on December 7 to cast our ballast, what should we have at the back of our mind? Whilst you are also carried away by the promises of these two political parties that there are cost implications when you get excited that, listen, when you go to invest, you're not going to pay. When you go to first year, coming from free SHS, you're going to be catered for, uh, your, 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 your investment or your loan is going to be cancelled and all those things. That is one. And also, listen, what advice do you have for these political parties? I mean, as a finance lecturer, a senior finance economist as well, listen, the real deal out there is the deal is tough. I think. Let's, let's look at these two things, Doc. Yeah, I think um, it's important to look at, you know, the, the possible sources of finance before... You, you go into the promises. Now, 
it's not about just raising money. Sometimes we, we, we bluff and say that, okay, fine, we've, we've been able to raise money from the euro bond market. There was an oversubscription on our bond, which is giving a good signal that maybe Ghana is doing well or something. But trust me, the question is, at what cost are you borrowing? Maybe you are desperate to bring the money here. And the European environment is in such a way that even if they give their money to you for two years, they are happy because the kind of interest rate they have in their environment is completely different from you know, our environment. When you are promising them 7% and in their environment they can get 1.5%, within the two coupon payment, they, maybe they've covered the, the, the cost. So they are prepared to give money to you. But the question is at what cost? So for me, I think it is important you know, to be measured when it comes to our promises. You know, if you take the, the promises that were made in 2016 mm. and you align them to what has been achieved now. So far. You, you can see a clear variation. And in the end, if investors, sorry, voters are dissent and they want to really delve into, you know, what you promised them and what, you know, they see on the grounds, trust me, a lot of, you know, things will, will, will happen. Mm. So for me, you see, what the people are going to measure you based on what you promised them. Mm. There's nothing recently you could see competition on, on, on promises. Yes. Somebody was prepared to announce a free SHS, yeah. um, graduates who are going to the university, you know, to have a free... I mean, you are the university, the reality on the ground. Then the next two hours, you could see another party comes out to say, OK, fine. If uh, you're going to absorb maybe 50%, mm. now somebody says, OK, take all. I, I'm going to take mm. all. Mm. You could see, you know, parties scrambling for competition. Somebody, I will not say it's, it's, it's bad. Mm. But then in the end, you should know, you know, that what goes into it, which is the cost. Because you cannot promise, and then in the end, you don't know where the money is coming from. If you take the manifesto, the two manifestos, you could see clearly they were all silent on the source of funding. Mm. Where, where they, they come, where they strategy? Because they, if you tell me that this will be the cost implications to me as a voter, I'm not going to do that. Well, uh, I presume that they've not gone deeper into it to know the cost involved. Because if you, if you the where they come close, right, to give us an idea about the financing is the private sector engagement. Mm. But the question is, where is the incentive for the private man to come to your environment? Mm. The incentive is not there. Mm. When you look at the environment where your interest rate, you know, sometimes looking at the appetite for borrowing from the government side, yeah. you wonder whether the tendencies to bring interest rate down is sustainable or not. So effectively, I, 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 for me, I, 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 it, it gets out of my hands. When, what, what, what should the electorate be looking at? Listen, that listen that if somebody is promising me that when I come to power, uh, your loans are going to be waived off, giving you... F <laughs> should, we, should, we, should, we, should we be careful in weighing some of these promises and in deciding when we go to the ballot what we're going to do? Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, because whatever has been promised, I mean, should give you a guide as to, you know, the, the proportion that can be delivered mm. on the ground. I mean, we have history. I mean, parties have promised mm. in the past. And we always measure them based on, you know, what they deliver. Mm. So if you look at it and you realize that the variations between what was promised and then what has been delivered being huge, then you should know that maybe somebody is not being truthful in managing the affairs mm. of your country. Mm. Mm. So that should be something that will guide you as, as a voter. But, but, but Prof, mo to moving forward, sorry, the reality on the ground is that tough times are ahead of us, irrespective sure. of I mean, whoever wins. Should we let people appreciate that? Listen there could be some tax hikes coming from COVID-19 expenditure and all the rest. And that's the reality on the ground. Well, I mean, we've been enjoying some... Even though you don't, you will not prescribe or that we should be doing that. You but see, the reality you see, on the George, ground is that... we need to understand that we've been, we've been enjoying some freebies now. I call them deferred payment we're supposed to do. Deferred payment in a sense that they are not sustainable. Yeah. There are things that in the long run will bounce back to you. You know, if the government tells you you are enjoying free electricity, you are enjoying free water now, you shouldn't be so happy. Because going forward, if the government gets hard up with funds, they have no choice than to squeeze you, the citizens, to pay back whatever mm. has been lost. So effectively, I would say that, yes, in the end, um, you are enjoying now, but trust me, brace yourself. I mean, going forward, the market is clear. We can see the future. Finance is dried up almost everywhere. And strategically, we've not restructured really our financing to attract, you know, funds in a cheaper way. 
When you take, I mean, infrastructure, for instance, there's nowhere in any of the manifestos that I see a green infrastructure, mm. which is, you know, a wave that is blowing globally, mm. for which countries are taking advantage of it to attract, you know, funding at a cheaper cost. Because now, you know, the investor is becoming aware. Where their money is going, they want to really be sure that the, 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 the proceeds that will be coming are sustainable. Mm. But what do we see in the manifesto? We don't see that. So effectively, clearly, the source of financing is it's a, problem. a problem. And I foresee a situation where, you know, tax increment, and the tax increment is not going to be, I mean, widening the tax net. Because all the investment that we've done, they are not really coming together to help us widen the tax net. Mm. But then I can see the ordinary tax, you know, payer being burdened mm. every now and then. And then we're going, you know, the vertical direction of increasing Mr. our revenue. Mr. Fosudote, beyond December 7th, reality on the ground, what should businesses be doing? How should we conscientize ourselves right now? Listen, irrespective of whoever wins come December 8th, what is the reality out there for us in terms of businesses? I think businesses should realize the strategic impact on their businesses as a result of the impact on the larger economy on the promises governments have made. Uh, I think Lord, 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 Lord Mesa uh, hinted on that, uh, mm -hmm. on, on one of the promises that both parties have agreed on, which has to do with making tertiary education free, uh, mm -hmm. in addition to what we've already had with, uh, with the free SHS. So clearly, that is going to further burden uh, government. That means that part of the monies that government will use to cushion businesses is already going to go into that sector. And the yield on that is not immediate. It's a, it has a long gestation okay. period. In an era where you have COVID having dropped our GDP from the projected 5.8 to already 0.9, mm -hmm. uh, we hope to go back to 5.7 next year, all things being equal. So, so we, we face with that. What should businesses do? Because governments cannot be strategic in election year in terms of the economy, because to be strategic, they have to make the hard decisions, which they would not make. I mean, no political party will make those hard decisions because it will affect their chances of winning. Mm. So businesses have to be strategic in, 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 a, in a different way to push government. One, offer ideas. Two, engage government constantly. Three, demand from government the right things that have to be done. I mean, these are the only ways government listens. Listen. Because if businesses don't do that, then businesses rather choose to position themselves to align with one party or the other, or to align with things that in the long run is detrimental to the wider economy, then at the end of the day, businesses will suffer. So that's how I would like businesses to constantly engage, offer ideas on how government can attain its promises without sacrificing the, 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 the larger uh, downside, I mean, effect on the economy. And at the end of the day, we will all try, but I, I think I'm quite hopeful that things will be all right, no matter the fact that we are going to have tough times. On that hope, no, we'll take a short commission. But when I'm back, I'll go to Nose Bonsu, president of the Private Enterprise Federation, and also Sir Chuma Kobwa in how they are positioning themselves going into next year for the challenges that hold for their members and even the business community. This is PM Express Business Edition, looking at the political promises and the expectations of the business community going to these elections and even next year as well. So I'll let them... Welcome back to PM Express Business Edition as you look at those uh, political manifesto promises and the expectations of businesses going into December 7. But looking beyond these elections as well, what are the real challenges ahead of us going into next year for the business community? What are the expectations? Let me try and wrap up with my guest on Zoom and then get back to Dr. Lord Mensah in studio. So let me go to Sir Chum Akobwa, Chief Executive of the Association of Ghana Industries. Seth, so wrapping up with you, going into next year for you, what are your expectations and what should these political parties or whoever will win have in mind for the sector? It looks like you have to unmute your button, Seth. If you can hear me, you have to unmute. <coughs> yes. So yes, George, industries have high expectations because we are receiving good promises. And why not? We should take advantage of the promises that are being made. Realistic and, promises. 
Well, let, let's see how it, how it pans out. But I mean, if you look at both manifestos, uh, different areas of promises when it comes to funding. Um, MPP is talking about the establishment of a development bank that has been the uh, discussion for some time. And this is talking about repositioning a Zim bank to provide the needed finance for exports. Uh, when it comes to raw materials, MPP is talking about the bauxite chain, uh, ensuring that the iron and steel industry is also having the needed support to, to come up strongly, making use of local raw materials. And this is talking about similar thing, incentives for exploitation of minerals and so on and so forth. So all have good promises. That's what I'm saying that we have high expectations as long as the promises are concerned. But of course, we are also mindful of the fact that generating the income to make sure that these uh, expectations or these uh, promises Amen. come into reality is another thing. Having said that, I think that we are also quite optimistic that if things are well managed, um, we should be able to survive because we've survived during this COVID period. Mm. There are challenges along the line. There's no doubt about it because foreign direct investment is definitely going to be affected because of the COVID. So that has an effect. But then there's an opportunity coming through the window of the ASCFTA, the African Trade Continental Free Trade Agreement. That is creating a big market opportunity. And already Ghana is one of the big investment destinations in West Africa. And then even in the whole of Africa, we are among the top 10 or so. So the possibility of getting more investment into the country and producing on large scale and exporting to Africa is high. So that's an opportunity. Okay. So we are optimistic, but we are also mindful of the challenges. Mm. For industries and businesses, as David said, we need to continuously engage government. Whichever government is in power, we need to engage them and, and put reality to some of the uh, promises they've made. Mm. If we don't engage them and direct issues. I'm sure we may not get the needed uh, expectation and results that we need. So okay. it's very important that we constantly engage and put forward our strong views, especially mm. when it comes to uh, tax administration, tax imposition, channeling of resources. And for us as industry, our critical interest is how do we develop the productive sector of Ghana? Mm. Because we are they are also talking a lot about creating jobs. Okay. And we believe that creating jobs should be part of the agenda, but it mm. should come from the productive sector, what is manufacturing and industrialization. Okay. And I think that if we're able to channel our resources there and guide government in that step, I'm sure we'll achieve good results and then our businesses will also grow. Okay. Then I'll say, Bonzu, in, in two minutes, are you that optimistic or, listen, there are real tough times ahead for us in respect of George, whoever wins? I don't know what you said, two minutes and optimism. <laughs> Because I'm wrapping up with you. We to do business. In our environment, we don't have any capital mobilization. All we know is we don't have a track record of having managed any development bank. But we keep creating them, starting from uh, the NIB, Agriculture Development Bank. Now we have the Exim and all. Let's use the system to create liquidity that private sector can. Sorry, it looks like we've lost Nana. Nana, if you can still connect with me, you're wrapping up. Sorry, I, I, we lost uh, our system. Uh, so, so, look, Doc, I mean, so what advice do you have for these two political parties? I mean, listen, be careful because, listen, there's real challenge ahead of us. Yeah, well, um, clearly on the grounds, you could see, like I mentioned earlier, I mean, funding will be a problem. But then in the end, if it turns up that we are going in the direction of increasing taxes, we have to be careful because to a certain threshold, it might, you know, crumble businesses. And then also, if you are increasing taxes and it turns up that businesses are going down, then you ask yourself, what is the sense of using, you know, those possible monetary policy channels to make sure that interest rate comes down? What do we gain from that? You might not gain anything from it. So for me, in as much as they are making the promises, in the end, they are going to finance them. Where would the money coming from? My colleague earlier mentioned, you know, I mean, possible adding value to our local production and all those. I mean, we've had that already, but then would they, did they, you know, did we realize them? That's the question we Let me just quickly ask. pick David Fosudote, yes. and I'll come back. Mr. Fosudote, I would uh, give you just two minutes and looking to the crystal ball, which you always do, what do you have to tell us? 
in two minutes. Which aspect of the crystal ball do you want me to look into? The now? crystal ball about whether we're going to. I mean, who is going to win? <laughs> oh no, no, no! I'm not going to go into that uh, angle of the crystal ball. Uh, the last time I looked in that crystal ball, I decided not to see. Tell you what I find there. Mm. But, but let's look at the crystal ball in terms of business. Uh, there are some things which have come to stay. Uh, value addition to raw materials, for example, bauxite to aluminium integrated industry has definitely come to stay. Uh, I expect that whoever wins should continue such a, a program. There is a competition for infrastructure among the two parties. Uh, I believe that has come to stay. Uh, the important thing is how to fund it. My advice uh, in looking into the crystal ball on these important things is very simple. Whoever wins should not behave like the ideas are all within one political party or within just the members of the political party, but should broaden the scope and bring everybody on board, especially businesses, and try to let us all contribute ideas and, and, and so our, our uh, quota to the implementation of the achievement of the goals of their manifesto. Mm. And I think collectively, I mean, we will all succeed. Mm. It's, it's unfortunate that you didn't want to look into the crystal ball to see who <laughs> you predicted the U.S. elections and you got a spot on. In other elections, you've done it as well. But, well, I'll give you another opportunity, another time to do that for us. Maybe. I, I assume this is a business show. That's why I'm avoiding the prediction. <laughs> but, so, Doug, let me let you have the final word right. on this about going forward, the real challenge for us and the advice for these two political parties. You have some few days to still vote, though. Yeah, I think uh, the challenges are clear. It has to do with the financing of what they have promised. And for me, I mean, going forward, even though they have avalanche of promises, I'm expecting that they will prioritize them. In the end, if you promise, you know, free SHS, I mean, continuation, and then you, if you promise, you know, I mean, um, <laughs> I mean, full financing yeah, yeah. of um, SHS, <laughs> You should know that there are other, you know, demands. It might not necessarily be that take that project immediately. It could be that other project could precede that one for which it will necessarily finance, you know, what you are promising. So, uh, it, for me, they need to look at, you know, a portfolio of the promises that they've given to Ghanaians, and then how to pick and choose the ones that will benefit Ghanaians. And like earlier on, what uh, my 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 part my my. I mean, partner David was, uh, yeah, David was saying, um, I think we need to look at how we can bring, you know, on board. I the mean, winner takes all things shouldn't be working. It, it should stop, mm -hmm. you know, for now. And in the end, I mean, get contribution from people and see how we can implement some of these things, you know, successfully. The challenges, we cannot run away from them. Mm -hmm. Every economy has to do with realigning and then, you know, reallocation of your expenditure and then your revenue. But then in the end, how you prioritize them is very, very key. It comes to beat down some of the unnecessary costs that comes to with um, but, this but, expenditure. But, 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 Doc, despite some of these concerns that you've raised again, if you look at the growth projections, with the IMF, World Bank, Bloomberg, it appears that these other institutions are quite optimistic that things will quite pick up strongly next year. Well, things look good in a sense that, you know, COVID is something that brought the economy down. But COVID is not war. COVID did not come to destroy the economic structure. We have the structures there. But then in the end, how agents within those structures or within the economy can easily move about and then, you know, I mean, bring about those vibrant economic activities for which most countries generate their revenue from is what they are looking at. So when things start picking up, it will pick up so quickly. It won't be like, I mean, a wall that you've, you've seen infrastructure being graced down, you have to rebuild before you get agents being active within mm. them and mm. all those. So mm. the systems are still there. But Just that the, the human movement that are supposed to create that economic vibrancy is what is missing. Now because Dog, I'll come back to you. Let me go to Nana. To Nana, Nana Sebuns. We lost him. Nana, I, I said two minutes, but now I'm going to give you one minute because of time challenges. If you wrap up for me, please. Nana Sebuns, the president of PEF. If you can hear me, can we wrap up with you in just a minute? You're back. Looks like we're still. Yeah, sorry, uh, technology didn't. So, uh, your, your, your final words, uh, 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 Doc. Uh, yeah, I mean, what I would say is that Ghanaians should be, shouldn't be so happy. I mean, 
we've seen the promises come, but then in the end, we should brace ourselves, I mean, for tough times ahead. In the end, um, when your taxes are being increased, remember that you've enjoyed some free water, free electricity somewhere some time ago, and all those to reflect whatever you've lost. Dr. Lord Mensa is a senior finance lecturer, and he was my lecturer in the University of Ghana, very sharp. Uh, and I'm grateful to share a table with him tonight, of course. And he's also a finance economics as well. Professor Dote is a partner at ABN. David Sechuma Kabwa is the chief executive of the Association of Ghana Industries. And apologies, a thousand apologies to Nanao Serbo. So we lost you there when you're making a quite a brilliant contribution on that one. And I'm sorry. Well, also soon we have to draw the curtain down on PM Express Business Edition. Many thanks to the lawyer and also Sechuma Kabwa and Nanao Serbo as well. We have some few days go into the box and make that critical and wise decision. Have a great day. Uh -huh.